everybody, welcome live to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Hope you guys are doing well. You are in for a spectacular tree as we have an iconic actress, Emmy, Golden Globe winning, beloved actress. You've seen her for years on television, in film, some of your favorite TV series, and lots more, lots of productions. She has provided decades of entertainment and thought-provoking programming for all of us here in America and worldwide. I'm talking about the one and only Sharon Gless is here. Yes, now, of course, you know her. As soon as I say the name, of course, Cagney Lacey comes up. However, she is responsible for hours and hours and hours of programming in so many other uh, ways, shapes, and forms. And we're going to talk about that as well. She has also penned this fabulous memoir, yes, about a year ago, and it is a bestseller. It is really incredible. It is open. It is real. It's authentic. She lays it all out. She spells it all out, and she does it also with emotion, with wit, and lots of wisdom. There's a lot of funny moments and revealing moments in it as well. Apparently, there are complaints. Sharon Gless, that is, again, the memoir that everybody has been talking about. And of course, as I mentioned, Emmy winning, Golden Globe winning too. She's got uh, the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which was really a spectacular moment for her as well. This is quite a treat that she's joining us from uh, South Miami, Florida, where she makes her home, originally from California, but she's in beautiful, sunny Florida. And of course, we all know her for Cagney and Lacey and uh, the years on there. You know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stories about this show. If you're a big fan of Cagney and Lacey and like 35 million people a week were, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes. It's, you know, nothing is always as smooth and easy as it seems. Matter of fact, the series was canceled twice. Did you know that? We'll talk about some of that as well. But uh, she and, of course, Time Daily were epic together as teaming up as Cag Cagney and Lacey. It was really a fantastic series. It's still talked about today. And Sharon, again, made her mark in so many great series, groundbreaking series, too, on Showtime, Queer as Folk, with that extraordinary cast of uh, actors and actresses as well. Yep, there she is there. There she is with Hal Sparks and uh, an iconic series, groundbreaking series on so many levels. Uh, you may remember as well, Burn Notice, that was riveting in that and uh, so much more. We're going to talk about these. And The Trials of Rosie O'Neill, another. How about Fast Charlie? Remember Fast Charlie? Yep. And Casualty, another. Uh, again, if you really look back at her extraordinary career, she has been on our screens for a long time and has loved every second of it. Uh, Switch, there you go, with Robert Wagner and Eddie uh, Albert, another fantastic one. And even the uh, miniseries Centennial, you remember that as well. How about, this is jogging a few memories here for our viewers, and there's a lot of TV fans out there, uh, House Calls, another one. That was a terrific one, too. And she had replaced uh, Lynn Redgrave in that. And there's some really incredible stories about that one as well. Even in this, too, the Scarlett O'Hara War, she was in that. Just the shortlist gang. And I want to show you this, too, because this is something recent that is near and dear to her heart that she, you know, created, produced. She's uh, in. This is Show Her the Money. And you can see all the awards, critically acclaimed on the bottom, this is a phenomenal documentary that um, is really hot off the presses. And we're going to talk about that as uh, we have an opportunity to welcome her to the show. She, again, is an iconic figure in American television and entertainment. And it is our pleasure to have her here on the show. Again, TV viewers worldwide know and love the iconic characters brought to life over the would you believe the last five decades by multi Emmy and Golden Globe winning actress Sharon Gless as the final contract player at Universal Studios? Sharon guest starred and co starred in many of TV's top rated series, including The Rockford Files, Marcus Welby, MD, The Bob Newhart Show. She's got a fabulous story about that, and Suzanne Plachette, House Calls, Switch, over 30 million viewers a week watched. Sharon as New York police detective Christine Cagney in the first hour long drama to feature two females in leading roles. And of course that was 
Cagney and Lacey on CBS, a beloved, beloved series. Um, and that's six Emmy winning seasons, too, with uh, Sharon winning two of them. Followed up with the award winning star turn in two seasons of The Trials of Rosie O'Neill for CBS. Another generation of viewers fell in love with her portrayal of as Debbie Novotny, a devoted mom for a gay son and a confidant and loyal supporter to his gay friends for all five seasons of Showtime's Queer as Folk. And that was another, again, as I was telling you, another iconic series that people still talk about today because it was really groundbreaking on so many extraordinary levels. And uh, you had, if you had not seen the series, uh, it might even be on DVD or there might be ways that you can you know, get it and see it. But it was really incredible. So that's just the short list. She's been in theater and graced the stages over the years. She's extraordinary. And she has one of the wittiest, driest sense of humors out there. Maybe we'll even get a little of it tonight here on the Gym Master Show Live. Without further ado, fresh from South Florida. It's not necessarily sunny right now, but uh, we have some sunshine coming our way with Sharon Glass on the Gym Master Show Live. Sharon, welcome to the show. Hi, Jim. Thank you. It's raining here now. Oh, it's raining. It's raining <laughs> oh. in Florida. Hey, I want to let the viewers know, too, that Sharon went all out. That is not a green screen living room background. That's the re those chairs and pillows and plants and all. That's real. That's real. <laughs> right, this wallpaper is from the Beverly Hills Hotel in, in L.A. I thought when I first moved here 30 years ago, I thought I'd take a little piece of Hollywood with me. That is so cool. So the, the actual wallpaper that we're seeing from the hotel, it's was actually the line, the hallways of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Wow, that is fantastic. And I went and found it and bought it and brought it here. And that's a, office. That's beautiful. How long ago did you move? You know, I was mentioning we're headed there for the holidays, too, to Florida for our family that's there. Um, we always tend to go down and have a great time. How long ago did you make Florida your home, Sharon? I think it's been over 25 years now. Um, my husband retired Yeah, and he didn't believe that you could retire from Hollywood and still live in it. So he moved us here, but I, you know, I'm married to a feminist. So, um, I just continued working all these years. He's been swell about it. You know, I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, is he also from California? Yes. We're both yeah. born and raised in LA. Yeah. He so was a, he was a poor Jewish boy from East LA. <laughs> so if you uh, didn't do Florida, what would be the other option? Switzerland or? <laughs> well, I, I loved LA. I, I probably would not have left. Um, yeah. But if I were going to live somewhere else, I also I would love to consider London. I mm. love London. Nice. I love that. That's a good, that's a good choice. So uh, the holidays are here. Are you going to be spending time with the family? Right. Are they coming in to you? See you there in Florida? Uh, no, actually, I'm going to Los Angeles to be with my family this year. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Do you have certain traditions that you do? or? Uh, well, it, it depends on, on what year it is, you know, because Barney has his family also. But his big holiday is Thanksgiving. Yes. He likes to be in L.A. with his family at Thanksgiving. And I like to be with my family at Christmas. So this year I won. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. My, my husband's birthday, Barney's birthday, is also December 23rd. It is. So he's not a big fan of Christmas. You know, when you would get a mitten for Christmas, he, when you would get a mitten for his birthday. That's funny. Mm. <laughs> Do you like to cook? Are you a cooker? Do you bake? No, but before I became an actress, I used to love to cook. And then I got uh, the, that creativity that I used in the kitchen. I just used when I was on a sound stage and I never went back to cooking. Mm. But, but I do like make a very good Irish stew. Oh yes, that's yeah. right. The yeah. Irish, yeah, I'm Irish on my dad's uh, father. Well, his, my dad's mother's side and they had uh, come over from Ireland and they settled in New York city and in, in oh. Astoria, Astoria, which was very Irish and Italian and two blocks from Tony Bennett growing up, my dad. And, uh, I would yeah. love to have been from New, from New York. It sounds so much chicer than L.A., but 
Do you, I, I would imagine Pete, you get that question sometimes that people think you might be, right? Because of your enthusiasm, your passion, your energy. I don't know if it's an accent or but yeah, yeah. several people think I'm from New York. Or, or, or East Coast, right? I would absolutely. But I'm definitely. not an L.A. girl, born and yeah. raised. There's a certain passion, certain energy that you have that just exudes, you know, like keep it moving, folks. Let's let's make it happen. That I you just vote. returned from New York. I just came back two days ago. You did for a special event. I was promoting uh, "Show Her the Money," which, yes, you know, that's congratulations on that. We'll talk about some of the other things and rewind a little, but but tell us about that because I know that's near and dear to your heart. And congratulations on that. Well, I. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really the women who are featured in it who are the outstanding ones. Yeah. Um, 2% of, of um, money is available to women. Right. To invest and 98% is available to men. Yeah. And so we're going to change that. Yep. And every city that we've aired in so far, we've won best documentary. Wow. Four, four times now. Congratulations. Thank you. When did you come up with the idea? What was the inspiration for the idea and how long ago was that? I did not come up with the idea. Um, my my uh, best friend, Don LaFrieda, is one of the women featured in it. And um, I went to watch a pitch session with women who were pitching their products to other women who had money to invest. And I was so moved, so moved by the stories. And um, I, anyway, I, I asked if I could get involved. And here I am, involved. Fantastic. After that is Peggy and Lacey was sort of the next step, you know? Yes, right, exactly, yes. Um, well, didn't you, wasn't there a very important part in, during your life where you marched for women's rights too, you you were able to get involved in that. Yeah, that was a special time for you, wasn't well, it? it? I, Jim, when we were shooting Cagney and Lacey, uh, I don't. I think I can speak for time. We didn't know that we were getting thirty-five million viewers a week. We didn't know what our numbers were. We didn't know if people were liking us or not. We'd been thrown off the earth three times, um, and. Anyway, when it was over, or close to being over, um, we were asked to march uh, on Washington, the Women's March. And so they put time to me in the front with Whoopi and Gloria Steinem. And, and um, so when we got to our location, which was like a stage that you look out on the Washington Monument, and Gloria says, go out there. Go out there. What do I say? She says, you don't say anything, just go out there. I said, Tyne, Gloria wants us to go out there. Yeah. So we did. Glory, whatever Gloria wants, Gloria gets. And we walked out. And to my great surprise, tens of thousands of women started screaming and crying and clapping. And I looked at Tyne thinking, is this what we've done? Mm. Um, it was so extraordinary to me. It was such a lesson uh, to realize the impact we were having. And we never felt it would, that you know, take off your hat to us because of the impact we were having. We had the material. Nobody was writing for women in the 80s. Nobody. And um, while we were on the air, one of us always won the Emmy. Mm. I won four of them. I won two of them. And not because we were so brilliant, I do believe Tyne Daly is brilliant. We had the material, Jim, and nobody was writing for women then. And um, it changed the history of television for women. It really did. I, yeah. feel like we had no, I feel like we had nothing to do with it. You know, we were just lucky enough to be given the material, be handed the roles, and uh, we ran with it. You know, it makes me think similarly to somebody we just lost, Norman Lear, and the groundbreaking shows that he developed yes. uh, that touched all our lives and still touch our lives. Cagney and Lacey had those elements because you covered a lot of ground and storylines that weren't really dealt with 
previously uh, on, in dramas or on television at all, well, which I think is fantastic. Of, some of our episodes, uh, our affiliate stations, some CBS affiliate stations would not air them, refuse to. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. I, it just was, they just didn't want to hear. Yeah. Well, you mentioned it was canceled uh, two to three times, which three for times. some people may be surprised. Like a, a show like that, that's so beloved and, and, and Emmy winning and so much more. Uh, what were, were they afraid of it? Is that why it was canceled? Because obviously 35 million people watching. I, d I don't know. The you networks know. were run by men at the time. Uh, but it was just, I guess, very daring. Yeah. Uh, Honest, I didn't think so, and I don't think time thought so. We were just telling the truth, and our our characters, I think, were very real. Um, my character was an alcoholic. Right. Um, right. They, they, most heroes, you know, in a TV show, never fall from grace. They're heroes. Mm -hmm. Well, Cagney was no hero. Yeah, she was a hero. She passed herself off as a hero. But she was tormented. She was a boozer. So was her father. We introduced the idea of a lumpectomy to women. Mary Beth Lacey got breast cancer. And women didn't know about the lumpectomy. They thought you had to lose a breast. Mm. Um, these are just, just small examples of, of, what, of what we were lucky enough to be handed. Yeah. To, to portray it, you know, and, and really I can't take any bows. I was just lucky enough to have been hired to do the role. How did that come about? How did the opportunity to be a part of such a groundbreaking series like that develop for you, Sharon? Well, I was stupid enough to turn it down the first two times. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As Barney Rosenzweig, who is now my husband and the man who right. created the show. That's right. Said, Sometimes actors are not the best judges of material. So clearly I was not a good judge of material and um, I didn't want to do it. I had done a pilot where I played a cop with a male partner and it didn't sell. And I just didn't want to go around packing a rod, you know, um, I was wrong. And um, so finally I wised up and I did do it. Uh, luckily with Tyne Daly uh, who had played Lacey twice already. And the Cagneys kept shifting. Um, anyway, she's my favorite acting partner. Oh, yeah. She's my best friends today. Yeah. We didn't have time, Jim, to be friends. That happens, right? No time to be friends. None. Yeah. None. And now we're like best friends. We talk on the phone, I'd say, three or four times a week. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you know, viewers love hearing that when uh, groups stay together. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. And, you know, you've been through a lot of life together. Yes. And, you know, the thing about the two of you on that series, you could see also and feel the, the camaraderie, uh, mm -hmm. the respect for one another, uh, one lifting the other, the team yes. I feeling. Think so respect. They were very different. They are right, different, but there was a mutual respect. I mean, our lives depended on each other. You know, you you even had to discuss as far as like the billing too, right? The names and they a really fantastic story that you tell is that they went through the trouble, producers and all to each week have it where your name was at the top and then Tynes, then yours, then da, 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 with, that's we a lot of work. Every week, I mean, it cost them a fortune. <laughs> yeah. to do the main titles, but every week it would switch. Um, and, uh, oh, also, oh, so on, on TV, on, on the series, our names would switch every week. And whoever was on the left, which is the top billing, whoever was on the left, uh, had to be on the right in a print ad. We actually swapped in print ads also every week. <laughs> That's At a the lot. Time it just meant a lot to us that. Yes, of course. I had it, done so many series, and I just and I'd been billed over the title many times, and I. Yeah. At the time, I just thought it was I, I couldn't not. Right. 
have top billing. But of course, yeah. Diane Daly, rightfully so, felt she should have top billing. So. I think it's an ingenious idea. And, and I think it's that- Barney Rosenzweig's idea. Yeah, I, I was, I was going to say- He wasn't going to let us go. He wasn't going to let us go. I, I was going to say that the, I think that- it, I've often watched a lot of the shows in the industry and I've said, gee, you know, it would be great if they did sort of rotate like that. Uh, it's a great idea. It was like uh, groundbreaking on so many different levels. You know, Switch was another one too, going back a little bit that you, you were know, I talked to of. Robert Wagner two or three times a week. Do you really? I do. Wow. I love that man so much. He was so good to me. Class act. Uh, yeah. What was it like being a part of that series? And then, of course, not only working with Robert, but also Eddie Albert. It was wonderful. It was a, it was a, a lesson. Yeah. Every, every show was a lesson for me. I used to try and tease with Eddie. <laughs> like that poor child. <laughs> and once I said to Eddie, he was wearing, he always wore a bright red sweater whenever his character was at his desk. And I said, you know, trying to be funny. I said, are you trying to upstage me with that red sweater? <laughs> he said, honey, I don't have to wear a red sweater to upstage you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He was a wonderful man. They both yeah. were. Yeah. They taught they, me so much. They did, huh? You're Very, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that people remember that. Yeah. Another one, too, that I know was also near and dear to your heart to be a part of was Centennial. This was something yes. quite special, huh? Very. Um, um, forgive me, I just went blank. Oh, yeah. And one of the actors in it became a very good friend of mine. Forgive me. Um, he was in that episode. He's gone now. Richard Chamberlain? No, no. It's uh, very funny. He had his own series playing it. Robert, Robert Conrad? No. Um, even better. Uh Oh come on! He had Let's a law, he had a trials like a law <laughs> he had a law show. Oh yes, uh, we became such good friends. And forgive me, I I just uh, I bet our, our viewers are probably kicking like, in. Anyway, he and I became very close. Yeah, and now he's he's gone. What was it like working on that? That was a special piece. Well, do you want to hear a story? Absolutely, you you're well, a fabulous yeah. storyteller. Well. This uh, on that particular show it was very freezing cold in Colorado, um, and um, I had a you know a little trailer, not a trailer, it was just a little quad, you know, those trailers that have four rooms in it, and um, I'd get dressed, and I'd lie down and I'd go to sleep, and every mo every morning, oh my gosh, this is awful that I can't remember his name. Anyway, this actor's assistant would come and say he would like you to come and sit in his trailer with him. Is it Raymond Burr? No. Oh, my God. This is terrible here on your show. Let's see. Uh, Robert Conrad, Richard Chamberlain, Raymond Burr, no. Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith. Okay. So, Andy, it's so important that you know his name because yeah. every morning his assistant would come and say, Andy wants to know if you'd come and like to sit in his trailer with him. And I said, well, thank you. Sure. So, you know, Andy had a big fancy trailer. So I'd go and we just really hit it off. And, um, and we saw each other, you know, back in LA. Uh, but it took a week, like to do our episode. And the next, and again, every morning I'd lie down and I'd fall asleep. Well, the next week, a young man came up and got to play in the, series and got my trailer got my room and they went to get him to tell him it was time for lunch they'd never used him yet and they found him dead the um yeah what is it called the good like carbon the uh poisoning carbon the, monoxide carbon poison. monoxide poison yeah. because the pipes were frozen and it was coming in the, the poison was coming into our rooms and that's why i kept falling asleep and andy kept saying get her out of there we had no idea. And then a fine young actor, like 22 years old, died in that same quad. Mm. Wow. That's incredible, huh? Yeah. So That's... Andy Griffin saved my life. And forgive me, Andy, that I went blank on your... Oh, no, yeah. He's, he's, he's listening. 
Uh, yeah, he's, you know, he and I would used to go out for lunch a lot in L.A. Did you? Yeah. And finally, one day he said, you want to have lunch again sometime? I said, sure. He says, at night? <laughs> <laughs> That's how he asked me out. That's it, huh? <laughs> yeah. At night? Mm -hmm. Didn't you, wasn't there a setup of some sort, if I remember correctly and, you know, doing the research with everything, uh, where you were to be the, you were to be dating Steven Spielberg? Oh. And this was right after he did that epic, which I was one of my favorite movies, is Duel with Dennis Duel. Weaver, it where that gasoline truck Steven chases Weaver. him through the desert. Right. Dennis Weaver. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. Right. Um, and he didn't have a date, I guess, for, uh, oh, it's that big director's dinner. It's, it's a huge dinner. And it was a big, important dinner. And they wanted him to have a date. So uh, uh, Zanuck, Richard Zanuck, called Money James, the head of our talent department at Universal, and said, may I see pictures of your contract players? So she sent over maybe eight of them. And... Zanuck picked me to go out with uh, Spielberg. He came and picked me up. And it was black tie. And he had a Roadrunner t-shirt underneath his tuxedo. And <laughs> he opens up and says, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that we didn't hit it off. We just sort of never spoke. He he was, you know, talking to big producers and stuff. And, yeah. and I ended up talking to him. A really fun guy at our table. I mean, we I had a great yeah. time. Yeah. It's just I wasn't his type. You are also, you've got the designation of being being the final contract player at Universal Studios, which is extraordinary. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, Universal was the last studio to have contract players. Contract players meant that you got paid whether you worked or not. And I started out at $186 a week. And I would have paid them. Yeah, big money, right? Yeah. They, they sort of train you. You're supposed to do your own training off the lot. But um, at any rate, I was there 10 years. And I was the last contract player to leave the lot. Um, the contract system ended, but they wouldn't let me go. And Monique James, who was head of talent, said, let her go. She could make some money. And the studio said, we want her for a series. So I stayed and replaced Lynn Redgrave in House Calls. And I'll tell you, she got screwed over. She quit because they would not give her the same. She was billed over the title. Um, and she wanted the same amount of money. Yeah. To start. Right. They wouldn't do it. So they let her go. So I was brought in. Hmm. Wow. Isn't that yeah. something? Mm. What was it like working with Wayne Rogers? Um, it was difficult for me. I mean, God rest his soul. Uh, he's no longer with us. But um, he, Wayne did, really didn't want a co-star. He just wanted it to be his show. And <laughs> when he introduced me, CBS had a party for me to introduce me to everybody in the press and, you know, and the cast and all that. And Wayne, so was supposed to introduce me to everybody. And his opening line was, I'll always remember. He said, she wasn't my choice. Hmm. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, even if that were true, you just don't say it. You just don't say she it. She wasn't my choice, but the network thinks she's the next Carol Lombard. So we have her. And, <laughs> and. Finally, one day he came to me and he said, stop doing Carol Lombard. I said, I'm not doing Carol Lombard. He said, well, I want you to do Grace Kelly. I said, I'm not doing anyone. I'm doing my character. But he, anyway, he thought that I um, was not serious enough. It's a comedy. Right. Right. You know? <laughs> um um, but I you were great in it. You were oh, great because right. you do have a fabulous comedic timing that is dry and uh, probably the, the Irish part of you where it's just <laughs> quick. And yeah, you know what I mean? Great, great storytellers as well, as, as I certainly know in my family. 
uh, so it comes naturally for well, the you. Rest of the cast, I need to say to you, the rest of the cast uh, of, of the show were wonderful to me. Yeah. Very, very welcoming. And they, they saw that I was in trouble with him. You know? Yeah, but, right. Yep. So they came and they comforted, which is fabulous. I have a funny story to tell you about Lynn Redgrave. Yeah, I would love to Do hear it. Oh, apps, plenty of time. Yeah, you got a big cup of coffee there. We got time. And I know who made that coffee. I did. <laughs> yeah. um, Lynn Redgrave, uh, I'd never met her. And here I am replacing her. And, and um, um, whoa, Wayne Rogers said, um, I could have saved her, you know. This is on my first interview with him. I'm going, okay. Um, anyway, when the show was canceled, finally, my, after my first year, it was canceled. And I was going on to do a show called Cagney and Lacey. But I wanted to have a party with all the cast. I never got to know them. You know, most of my scenes were with Wayne. And um, anyway, I had this party at my little house in the valley. And I thought, you know, I was a nervous writer, but I called up Lynn Redgrave. And I, thought, I said, look, at, I'm, I thought it was really classy of me, you know. I said, I, I'm having this party with the cast, and they miss you so much, Lynn. And I'd love to meet you, and I'd love it if you came, you know, to my party. And she said, she was classier than I was. She accepted. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, I have a funny bit we can do. I said, what? She said, let's have a huge fight. Mm -hmm. When I pull up, yeah, and my house is a little house with a driveway, and so I left the door open. I could see her lights come in to my driveway, so I left the door open and I went outside. I said, "Hmm, who could that be?" It's like eleven o'clock at night. Hmm, who could that be? And I went out, and of course it was Lynn Redgrave. And I said, "Hi, Lynn Redgrave." <laughs> I mean, she's Lynn yeah. Redgrave. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, "Hi, Sharon Glass." And she said, shall we start? I said, sure. And we started this horrible fight that I had taken her role. Is it taking your role as, I don't know what, what words I can say on your show. Anyway, I used some. You some effing role. took my role. You can't, yeah. act for, you can't act for dunk, you know. <laughs> I said that to Lynn Redgrave, by the way. And I bet she loved it. <laughs> and she says, F you. I said, yeah. F me, F you. <laughs> And everybody in the... Everybody, they must have been. Yeah. They recognized her voice. You can't yeah. mess with this Lynn Redgrave. No. And then I came back into the house and said some crude thing about her and slammed the door in her face. And then they were, the rest of the cast just like... So I opened the door. I said, would you get in here? And she came in and they all just, they loved her so much. And it was a... It was a cool night. That's cool. Now, you know how the world has changed since a story like that? Yeah. By the time you had wrapped, the two of you, you and Lynn wrapped up that whole fight and then told everybody about it. Today, people would have filmed it on their cell phones. They would have uploaded it on the internet and the world oh. would have thought it was real before right. you even had a chance to say, hey, it's not. I know. The You're way things are today, right? right? What, what, and yes, it would have been cool. just like, did you hear that Sharon Glass and Lynn Redgrave had a pulled each other's hair, insulting <laughs> each other? <laughs> I'm it was a, a better actress. actress. It's all her idea. She, yeah, yeah. she was uh, an extraordinary actress. She had a sense of humor too, right? She could oh, roll yes. with the punches, and oh, yeah. Yes. Did you ever see Georgie Girl? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. She yeah. Nominated. Yeah. Another, of course, burn notice. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I love your reactions to your own photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to a hairdresser and I said, I'm playing this Miami matron. And they all dye their hair in their bathrooms. One dump color. So I had, <laughs> I had my hair dyed platinum today. And yeah. she was written as a smoker. So I was yeah. Yeah. smoking three packs a day. Oops. Uh -huh. What was it like taking on that character? I loved it. At first, yeah. I wasn't sure who she was. Right. You know, since I was right. new. Right. They just wrote her as a chain-smoking hypochondriac. Yeah. And that's all the information I was given about her. So I just started working. 
um, uh, with uh, Michael. And um, um, sorry, the boy who played my son. Oh my God, right? Yes, it happens to everybody. Oh my God! When you I just, know. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, and together, we're over, that that series lasted um, uh, seven years. We were offered an eighth year, but he just said, "I'm guys, I'm done." You know, they they sort of burned the golden goose. But uh, quite a series, uh, you know, in its own right, and same Thank with. You. Yeah, the trails of uh, the trials of uh, Rosie O'Neill is another one. I got to go to bed with Robert Wagner in that one. Talk about a switch. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what was, what was uh, weird is I had been playing like his kid sister on Switch. Those right, right. And um, yeah, now here I am play, about to play his lover, and I was, I was, I must say, and I've done a lot of love scenes on yeah television. um but that was the one i was most nervous about and i went to the set to talk to him earlier because i had an idea about how i wanted to do our first kiss i wanted to just walk onto the set and just plant it on him. and and that isn't the way it was written um it was it was it, we had been fighting and I thought, I know how to do this. Instead of our making up and being loving and all that, and then we start necking in the office on the on the desk. I said, I want to just walk in, walk into his office unannounced and kiss him. So I went to have this talk with him and they said, um, uh, Mr. Wagner, you know, is, is in his dressing room. I said, oh, okay. And um, they said, uh, he's uh, shaving. I said, shaving? said, yeah, Sharon, it's 5.30, and he's been working with you since 8, and he knows he's going to kiss you. So he didn't want to scratch your skin. Come on. You've got to love a man like that. <laughs> I've done a lot of sex scenes on, on film, and I've never had a man care about whether my skin... Skin got scratched. Got scratched or not. That is that is amazing. That is, he's, a, he's a real gentleman. He is a, oh, a classy class. and handsome and, and just a wonderful laid back, smooth actor. Yeah. Um, but I was nervous kissing him because yeah. I'd known him as a kid. Right. You know, now that it switched, he, he said, um, and I just married Barney. And he said, Barney's on the set looking at us. When we're doing our necking scene, I said, "Where is this? Right behind the camera. He's hiding behind the camera." <laughs> so I turned. I said, "Barney, go away." <laughs> <laughs> and, and did he go or <laughs> Jeffrey Donovan? Forgive me, Jeffrey Donovan. Jeffrey yes. Donovan played the lead. Yes, her notice. Brilliant. Yes. Forgive me, just you know. No, no, no. some old woman. Not at all. There's a. They say hey, you've you've lived a lot of life. Continue to, and you've got all these people yeah. and all these names and all these phenomenal stories as well, which I think is absolutely incredible. For, for me, did not remember Jeffrey Donovan. My God, he yeah played my son for almost eight years. Right, exactly. And they offered us an eighth year on. They did. And yeah. Jeffrey just he said, "Guys, you burned me out." He was in every scene. So when never just, let up, never let up. Just, so when he sent that letter saying that they were wrapping up, the it was <laughs> it was a burn notice saying you burned burn me notice, out. That's right. Yeah, saying he you said, burned me out. Burn notice. He said <laughs> burn notice. That's it. I and know. It was a good, it was the first like spy show. Yeah. On television. It was it was a wonderful drama. Yes. Fast Charlie. That's Charlie. Look at me. Oh my God. That's cool hair, huh? You you take on these very cool roles, you know what I mean? Where you're they're real people with real stories. You know what I mean? The, the there's yeah. just something about the roles that you have been given and that you have then taken and mastered, where people feel they root for the person. They root this, for these characters. I hope so, because this is, it was one scene 
and only one. And when they sent it to me, they said it's starring Pierce Brosnan. I said, whoa, okay. Um, Pierce Brosnan, and boy, is he a wonderful guy. The kindest, very laid back, um, really super guy. Anyway, they sent me this one scene. They said, there's no point in our sending you the script because if you don't want to do this scene, you know, this, it's just one scene. That's all we're sending you. It was the naughtiest, dirtiest scene I have ever done in my career. And I had a ball. <laughs> I knew that would be the next line. Oh, my yeah. God, a ball. It just, I said, really? You can say this stuff? He said, Sharon, it's a motion picture. Yeah. But I've never seen a motion picture with this kind of scene in it. It was just out of my mouth. It's, it's... not that I was any nudity. Um, but the the there's a big, huge surprise at the end of my scene. Yeah. Very big. It's funny. Yeah, really. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't, but yeah. Uh, Pierce was a lovely, lovely man. When uh, I was sitting, that picture you saw of me sitting smoking, um, I didn't know anybody on the set. I literally was only there for one day. And I looked up from the bench, and there was Pierce in his car uh, getting ready to leave for the day because he and I weren't working until the next day. And um, he was just looking at me, and I sort of go, oh, my God, it's Pierce Brosnan, okay. And he just went, bye. Wow. And he was just leaving for the day, and it was just, just so kind. Yeah. You know, because I didn't know anybody. Right. Uh, and uh, what a lovely man he is. Absolutely fantastic. You, uh, I'm an actor, of course. Oh, absolutely. Yes. You, of course, as I mentioned, have graced many of the iconic TV series, too. The Rockford Files and Marcus Welby, MD. And the Bob Newhart show, too. And <laughs> you, you admired... Um, Suzanne like, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. I loved her so much. Yeah. Clearly the funniest woman I think I've ever known. Wasn't that a great ending to the second series oh, of Newhart? Yes. Where she, it, the whole thing he was wakes a dream. Up the dream and she's, she's there. It. The whole thing was That's a dream. brilliant. Yeah. A brilliant way to end that series. <laughs> Uh, and of course, we lost Mary Fran, who played his wife on that series, which was unfortunate. But and Suzanne's uh, gone now too. Suzanne's gone as well. Um, I, you have a Suzanne story? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I can say on your. Show. <laughs> Any Suzanne story is going to need some bleeping. Hey, well, you're here, and they're loving it. <laughs> I mean, do you really want me to tell you the story when I first you met her? Truth and advertising, right? <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm a brand new young actress. Had been nowhere done. Had done very little. I was under contract Universal, and I'd been loaned out, which was a big deal. I got loaned out to the Bob Newhart show. It wasn't a Universal project, and um, so I'm just sitting there. And it was a show that rehearses all day. They don't shoot. You know, the, these the sitcoms all rehearse all day, and then one day a week they shoot in front of a live audience. Anyway, so I'm just sitting there, you know, pretending like I'm not nervous. And Suzanne Blachette walks out and she said, well, I just got a call. I can't remember the name of the, the product. To sell women's deodorant spray. I said, really? Are you going to do it? She said, hell no. I can't say these words on your show. I can't, anyway, she she told the story about an actress who did accept the the job and went on national television and said that her privates smell. And I said, she said, I said, so you, are you going to do it? She said, no, I'm not going to do it. She said, this actress went on and said her her body smells. And another actress did it later and said her smells worse. <laughs> oh my God, I love this woman. I just love this woman. I don't know if she did it to put me at ease. <laughs> You know, because it was yeah. just, it was outrageous at the yeah. time. And yeah. um, so later I was able to sort of get back at her. Uh, my dentist was a famous, you know, Hollywood dentist. But he'd been my dentist since I was 17. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, I'm in there and I'm now an actress. And he said, do you know Suzanne Plachette? And I said, actually, I do. He said, well, she's in the waiting room. 
and I'd love to be her dentist. And he didn't need anybody, you know. He said, but, you know, maybe you could put in a good word for me. I said, sure. So <laughs> knowing Suzanne's sitting there, I wad up my cheek with tons of Kleenex, mm, tons of stuff. And I walk out into the, I don't know what I can say on your show, but I'll, you can bleep. Um, I walk out into the waiting room and I say, guy's a fucking butcher. Oh my God. <laughs> and I looked over at her and she's going. And I, then I said, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm altering my stories because I don't want to offend your audience. Nah, they're enjoying it. They're having a good time. Well, yeah. Yeah. Are. They got a lot of comments. I stand and I and I I don't want to, you know, offend anybody. You don't want to be a it's hard to tell casualty. a casualty. <laughs> That's right. It's hard to tell a Suzanne Pluchette story and not offend somebody. Right. Yeah, she was a real deal. Casualty is another casualty. one, huh? I did yeah. this in Wales. Yes. In Wales, England. Or is it like playing that role, taking that on? It was wonderful. Yeah, huh? I was appropriately nervous, you yeah. know, because I'm yeah. working with all these British actors. And mm -hmm. I'd done three plays in the West End. I've done theater there. Right. But I had not been on this show. And um, it's a really serious part, but they wrote her kind of funny because it was me. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was wonderful. The actors were fantastic. And they wrote... Uh, a a competition between a woman who was the head of the hospital and me who's the visiting surgeon from New York in England. I'm visiting England. Mm -hmm. Save the day. Right. And we wrote a, a wonderful combative theme between me and the actress who ran the hospital. Mm. Really wonderful insulting each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, the British are so smart and so clever. You know, you mentioned uh, London major theatrical productions, Misery and Chapter Two and Round Heeled Woman on London's West End and the U.S. tours as well. And recurring characters on The Exorcist and Casualty was BBC, The Gifted and Nip Tuck. Tell us about Nip Tuck and being involved in that. Um, Nip Tuck. Um, remind me, who is in Nip Tuck? Was that, was Rob Estes in that one? No, not that I, Nip Tuck. Yes, remember that one? Who was in it? Nip Tuck starred, let's bring. I'm so sorry. Just Nip Tuck is Dylan Walsh, Julian McMahon. Oh, Dr. Nip Tuck, Lee. oh, forgive me, Nip Tuck, oh, the plastic surgery. Yes. Oh, forgive me. Yeah, I was. I wasn't regular on that. I was loaned out to do that while I was doing, um, uh, ch uh, while I was doing another series, and um, I got a call from. See, it's just the famous man who produced it. The man who produced Nip Tuck. Anyway, he called me and asked me if I'd ever seen Misery. I said yes. Actually, I created the role of Annie Wilkes on stage. He said, oh, well, he said, I've written something that I think you're going to like. And it was really an outrageous piece. It was, was that Ryan Murphy? The Ryan producer? Murphy. Yeah. yeah. He never hired me again, so it doesn't matter if I remember his name or not. Right? <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful show. And that particular one, was, he said, was one of the sickest he'd ever written. Mm. And I got nominated for it. Yeah. 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 I yeah. never say this, but... I should have won for that one. Yeah. Yeah. You were fantastic in it. Absolutely. Well, it's just, he just gave me the material. Yeah. You know, it's just, it was a four, four episodes. Right. A recurring, sort of a recurring role for a while. And I was the next day after it aired, I was in a, like a young, a little girl's store. I saw a baseball jacket in pink for my granddaughter. So I went in and there was a young girl and I said, hi, um, I'm interested in buying that baseball jacket that's on your mannequin. Um, and she ran away. And a man come out, came out and he said, what's going on here? I said, nothing. I just inquired about the baseball jacket on the mannequin. And he said, oh, he said, it's you, it's your glasses. She saw the show last night and she's afraid of you. 
I said, really? <laughs> that's, hey, that's a compliment. That's, you know? she you must played, been, I mean, she must have been maybe 17 or 18, but still. Yeah, played that wall, it role was well. Glasses. It was these glasses. It, it was those glasses? Right. When Ryan Murphy saw me in a talk show with Tyne, it was a uh, women's talk show, and he called me. He said, was that an Armani suit you were wearing? I lied and said yes. And he said, are those your glasses? Do you always wear them? I said, I told the truth and said yes. And he said, I want you to do that exact look for this character. So he was very nice on the phone. He was a very nice guy. I never got to know him. Fast Charlie, I tell you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that is slated for release. Yes, it's come out. I believe it. It, I believe it premiered yesterday. Yes, right. Or, or Friday. I, I very recently because it's been being reviewed, and and I'm so thrilled that they just happened to mention my shocking scene. Co-starring Piers Brosnan and James Kahn. Yeah. I never got to work with Jimmy Kahn. He was there for a day. Yeah. He was there for a different day, and um, he said he did all his work from a wheelchair. Yeah. And um, they loved him. Yeah. And um, then when I arrived, he'd already finished his day and I never had the pleasure of meeting. Him. Yeah. Uh, another legendary person as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course, we, you know, would be remiss if we did not bring up this iconic or groundbreaking series based on the series that was in Britain. Um, when the call or email or text or lunch or whatever came saying, Sharon, we have an idea and we see a role for you in this series on Showtime. And initially it didn't just pop up on Showtime. They shopped it to other networks that were not sure HBO and others that didn't jump on it. HBO Showtime turned it down, turned it down and Silly them. went with Showtime. Yeah. Uh, how did this come about? And each one of these folks that you've had an opportunity to work with, um, they, you know what you, you know, what you noticed when you watch the series too, even though they're acting their roles, they really had a, again, respect and the other actors and actresses an admiration for you as Debbie, which you could see even beyond that. If you look close enough, they really were, honored to be working with you and what you brought to the table with that series. How did that role of Debbie come about for you? Um, I was in Chicago doing a play. <laughs> Here's how. Um, I was in Chicago doing a play and I had been asked to play um, in The Lion in Winter after this play. And I thought, well, that's a little more than I've ever taken on before. So I hired the best acting coach in Chicago to train me for the Lion in Winter while I was doing this other play. And so while I was there, I was there a couple of months and three months, I don't remember. Um, anyway, the, the actor and uh, my friend Peter, um, the, the acting coach uh, sent me, called me up. He said, Sharon, do you know about Queer as Folk? And I said, no. He said, well, it's a British show and they're going to do it in America. And um, Showtime's doing it, and I just read the script, and there's a role in there you really need to consider. I said, well, send it over. You wouldn't know about my interview today, but I'm often shy. <laughs> 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 and um, so I read it, and I've never, ever called anybody and said I want a part. You know, I just always hoped someone would do it for me, you know? Yeah. I read it and I put down the script and I called Showtime and the head of Showtime, Jerry Offsay, his assistant used to be Barney's assistant, my husband's assistant yeah. on Tagdy and Lacey. I said, Carol, I want, I want to be in this show. She said, you don't want to be in this show. I said, yes, I do. She said, Sharon, there's no money in it. I said, I don't care. They're filming in Canada too, right? And they're filming in Canada. I don't care. She said, well, I'll tell Jerry. They thought I wanted to play the young mother, the mm. beautiful blonde mother. And I, I was like almost 200 pounds when I went to do that show. And um, so the head of Showtime, Jerry, said, Sherry, he calls me. 
He said, Sharon, I like the idea of you playing Debbie. I think you'll bring a little class to the project. I said, Jerry, class is not what I had in mind. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, whatever. Would you mind if we fly you out? Would you meet our producers? I said, of course. Of course, I, I mean, of course I'm going to meet the producers. So I flew out and they hired me that day. And it was such a change in my life. I didn't look like Christine Cagney anymore. I was overweight. Um, I just sort of gone to seed. And uh, they took me anyway. It didn't matter what my size was. It didn't matter what I looked like. They wanted me for this role. And it changed my life. It, I moved from becoming a leading lady to becoming a character actress. And at first that was a little, a little jarring. Um, but again, it changed my life. It was another wonderful, wonderful role that I did, was able to do for five years. You and, stepped right into it and you, you made it your own. And you really, you could tell that you had a real fondness, affection, respect for the other actors and actresses oh in God. it. And you really, the They're, role of Debbie sort of, watching out for them, protecting, taking care. But you could see that as much as that was Debbie was also Sharon in a way, which was so beautiful to see. Well, uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it was extraordinary that one of the sexiest scenes I've ever seen on camera was the first scene I saw uh, in like a dailies or something. And it was an infant. The first scene from Queer as Folk that I saw was an infant sucking a mother's breast. And the infant is removed. And another woman comes in and puts her mouth on the breast. I thought, Whoa! I, it actually, it just threw me. And I thought, that is one of the sexiest things I've ever seen. And what courage it took for those two women to do that scene, I thought. I mean, I've never done scenes like that. And um, I asked them after I saw it, I said, that was extraordinary. I said, have you known each other before? They said, no, we were given a key. and told to check into a hotel room and get to know each other because we were shooting that scene the next morning. Wow. I said, well, God bless you, man. Yeah. Because all of those, all of those actors, they weren't exhibitionists. They were actors. They were all doing a lot of nudity. They made me leave the set. I said, that's my boy. That's my son. I can watch this. <laughs> Sharon, go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> I was never allowed on the set when the when the sex was going on. Did you do you stay? Does everybody stay in touch? Yes. Gail, Harold, Hal Sparks, everybody. Yes. yes, we see. I don't see Gail as much. And I don't see Randy as much. Randy lives in New York. And I think Gail was working in London. Um, but uh, but the rest of them I see in Los Angeles. We get together occasionally for dinner. And Peter Page is producing a series. And he just invited me uh, this last year to do a guest spot on is it. That the New Orleans one? No, uh, Peter Page is, is um, the uh, fire engine, the uh, fire engine 19, station 19. Yes. Okay. Yeah. With some very sexy boys in it. That's amazing, huh? That you're involved in that. Yes. I had a wonderful time. Peter directed it. Yeah. So he's not only the executive producer, he's also the director. The director as and, well. Uh, he writes them. Yeah. He's just a hands on guy, very talented. What was it like the this special day for you, Sharon? Which oh that day. Yeah. Well deserved and well earned for sure. We it, it, I had wanted this and I think time too, but she's not readily she doesn't readily say things like that. But I used to dream about it and then one day it happened. I called the head of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. And I found a spot that was empty on Hollywood Boulevard. It was right outside C.C. Brown's, mm. a very famous hot fudge Sunday place. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Sure, my mother used to see Shirley Temple there when she was a little girl. Oh, my God. Been around that long. It was right in front of C.C. Brown's. And right next to it was Bugs Bunny. So I called up the Chamber of Commerce, who was, you know, obviously in charge of all of this. Johnny, um, again. But I, I said, um, uh, Johnny, I saw a place where I'd light my star. I mean, we'd already been invited, you know, to have a star. And he said, name it, anything you want. It's just right outside C.C. Brown's. And it's next to Bugs Bunny. And he said, uh, Sharon, there is no place for Tyne Daly's star. I said, oh, I knew we were both receiving stars. I didn't know that they had to be next to each other. And he said, your husband wants you both to receive it on the same day. We've never done it before. We don't like it. We'd rather honor each of you individually, but... I said, well, however you guys want to do it, it's fine with me. And so Tyne and I have our, our stars right next to each other. How cool is that, huh? Sure. When I have friends come into town, I make them come and look at my star. It's also <laughs> convenient for Super Cagney Lacey fans, so they don't have to go searching block to block. That's there, right. There's one and there's the other. Get the photos <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> exactly. Very convenient. To, to and then Barney, there was a... Some of these things won't mean anything to your viewers, but there's a famous restaurant in Hollywood called Chasen's. Um, and Chasen's was closing Absolutely. the next week. It'd been yeah. open for a hundred years. Sure. Really famous people went there. And Barney rented it out for the day that we had our stars and um, had a huge lunch and invited the press. And yeah. So family and friends and Chasen's Chili and we're all featured that day. Wow. I realized when I yeah, referred to great your viewers yeah. don't know LA and I talk. About no, that's a Chasen's is a legendary, yeah. you know, just like Roman is Chinese. Uh, when I was on a television shoot in LA and I had some extra time, a friend of mine who was from LA said, do you want to go to lunch? And I said, sure. And he said, where would you like to go? I said, you tell me. And so we went to Santa Monica and we went to the Ivy. That oh, was, sure. a, that's Ivy, a great You went one. to Ivy at the shore. Yes. There's that an was, Ivy on Robertson Boulevard. In this w is the Hills. one right across from the, from the pier. Water. Yeah. Here. And so you went Terrific. to Ivy at the shore. Terrific I place. There. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. Were you? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way they just, you know, everybody's there and uh, celebrity as well as casual diner is there. And they just. Yeah, everybody mingles. It's no big deal that it's there's a res there. There's a respect for one another exactly. and the time, which is refreshing to see. Um, it is. And of course, this happening uh, more than once, boom. Oh, wow. mm. that was my second. Yeah. yeah. I always remember because of what I was wearing. I was going to say, right, to, to know that it's the second. <laughs> so, know. You, you know, from the... Uh, from the, the, the dress. The outfit, I huh? Remember, I found out. <laughs> I was... It was the evening that I was wearing that, and I had to make a presentation earlier. To somebody you know who's part of the job and i found out in between that that dress had cost me seven thousand dollars i mean now people spend three times that on dresses but i thought that was horrendous yeah i, said, I better win because i want people to see this one more time right i swear to god because the dress was so expensive i thought i i, I want everybody to see it again and damn if i didn't win and it wasn't one of those, you know, where the designer loans it for the evening, then you give it back kind of thing, like they do with jewelry sometimes and other what, our dresses. You right, their dresses are wardrobe. No, I had that dress made. Like, you had a custom made. And eventually, a lot of the dresses that I wore to award evenings, yeah, um, I gave to charity. There was a big um, fashion show one day in Hollywood, and any dresses that you wore. To the awards, they want, and you didn't want it anymore. And I thought, well, why do I want to keep it? You know, I'm older now. Um, and they wanted a picture of you in it. Mm. And somebody would model. And then somebody would model. Picture being shown. And that's how they, uh, that's how they sold some of these dresses that I, for charity. Yeah. That I donated. You penned your memoir seven years to yeah. get it out and 
from what the research says, and I do my research, you were was it you were brought to CBS and you thought they were going to talk about another possible series, but yes, it was burn notice was ending. And the word had gotten out that we were doing our last, you know, few months of burn notice. And they invited me back to CBS, which is where Katie and Lacey was shot and and um, many shows I'd done were at CBS. And um, so when I walked in, the president of CBS said, welcome home, Sharon. Mm. This is so cool. Okay, yeah, right? right? First of all, it was a lovely thing to say. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. Okay. So for one hour, I talked to them. They asked me questions and I babbled on like I am. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the meeting, forgive me, there's another name that just... Um, Anyway, forgive me, the president of, of CBS at the time, a woman who's wonderful. And she said, Sharon, you know, we own Simon & Schuster. Is I this said, not Nina? Nina. Nina, yeah. Nina, Nina. Task, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nina said, Sharon, you know, we own Simon & Schuster. I said, I didn't know that, Nina. And she said, well, we do, and I think you have a book in you. And I said, Nina, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a writer. She said, no. But you're a storyteller. I said, oh, okay. And the next day, the president of Simon & Schuster called me. I didn't return his call for a year. I just thought this is nothing that I'd want to do. It's nothing I'd be interested in. I don't have that gift. And after a year, I didn't get another series. So I thought, well, I can't just sit here. I'm going to start this. And I had written one chapter when I went in to meet the president. Um, and he asked me to read it. So I read it and the secretary down the hall started laughing because the door was open. And um, so I tried writing the book, but Simon Schuster complained my chapters were too short. I said, well, that's sort of how I tell the story, you know, yeah. boom, boom. And um, so I finally got somebody to help me. Every word is mine. He's yours. But, right. but yeah, but but putting it together in certain chapters and stuff, I needed help. Yeah. You uh you're very open and real and authentic and mm -hmm. funny and, and revealing. And it's an extraordinary, extraordinary read and critically acclaimed book as well. And, and oh, congr I got congratulations on it. Thank you. I got nominated for um best recording by an author. By the yeah. Audio Awards. So yes. My, my recording. Uh, I didn't you, you, matter of fact, several awards for the book. Amazon Editor's Book of the Month, a number one seller in autobiographies of actors and actresses, an Apple audiobook must listen, a best audiobook by Vulture.com, an Earphones Award winner from Audiophile as well. I didn't and know all of this. This is nice to hear. That's just, that's it. Isn't it amazing? And of course, the love of the fans and the readers as well. Um, your grandmother, very um, strong individual, very prominent individual in your life as well, right? Tell us about that. Well, she was my mother's mother, and um, she held the purse strings. And... Um, I don't mean she wasn't generous, but she was tough. Hmm. And when someone else holds the purse strings, you got to dance. Yeah. You know, and I don't mean ballet. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to perform just in your conduct, in your grades, uh, in my weight. I was constantly criticized for being too fat. And um, I was, I loved her, by the way very much but she frightened me and i just kept wanting her approval and um i worked hard but i just never was thin enough for her i never was social enough for her because you wouldn't know it by how i'm babbling but i'm shy when i don't know people um i'll do anything in character and have but personally i'm shy um, at any rate, I went to, uh, 
I loved her. And uh, you can think this is woo woo, but I went to a psychic a few years ago after it's my fine. Yeah. yeah. And I said, I want to ask a question about my grandmother. I said, I've become a success now. I make my own money and I've been blessed with making quite a bit. Um, I, and I'm successful. I have awards and people respect me for what I've done. And I asked the psychic, I said, is my grandmother proud of me now? Mm. Now? And she said, let me ask her. So she does this thing. She came out. She said, she said to tell you she's proud of you still. Mm. What a difference with the still, huh? Oh, and it was so my grandmother. Tell her I'm proud of her still. She used to frighten me, man, and I tried to dance as hard as I could. And she told me, she said, you're my favorite, so I'm hard on you. Right. And it was nice being the favorite, because, I mean, it was nice knowing that I was loved, but I just couldn't muster up. I got thrown out of college that she was paying for. <laughs> I was just like Peck's bad boy, but I wasn't. I was really... A good person i just would always get in trouble or make bad choices did she get to see your success or some of it at least no no she died when i was like 21 years old and i didn't even admit i wanted to be an actress till i was 26. that's late to decide you want to go into this business it's just late what was the pursuit prior I was a secretary behind the camera. I worked for different motion picture studios as a production secretary. I was very good at it. And um, I used to read. Part of my job and working for these directors was that I would read with the actresses who would come in to read for the parts of the movies we were making. And I did my best to do the best performance for them mm -hmm. that I could so they could get the part, you know? And then after a while, They'd get the part. I'd make out their paychecks. I'd make out mine. I said, wait a minute. I'm not afraid. I was better than she was in that reading. But I wasn't going after it. You know. It, it, right. Um, but I thought, I have to stop being afraid. Why don't I admit it's what I'd like to do? And in my job as a production assistant, I saw who was being hired. And not that they weren't lovely actresses, but I thought I was better than they were. Um, not that it's, it, I'm making it sound like it's a competitive business. It is. It is, sure. It is. Um, so I stopped being afraid and I was visiting my grandfather. He was Howard Hughes' attorney and Cecil B. DeMille's and Louis B. Mayer's. And That's right. He was very, very big in Hollywood. He was, he was uh, probably the most famous attorney of Hollywood in, in the golden days. And I went to visit him my company I'd worked for, it just folded. Um, my wedding engagement had been canceled. It was just a bad time. And my grandfather said, bring the station wagon to the desert, to Arizona. I think he just knew I had nothing going. And he said, come and stay with Mary and me, his new wife. My grandmother died. Um, I said, okay, Grandpa. Well, of course, on the way, I rear end somebody. I mean, it just was that time in my life, do you know? Right. Jim, I just, I couldn't win. I need this like a hole in the head. I got yeah. out my grandfather's station wagon. I pull up to his ranch house in Arizona. And he comes out. And you see, it's like a scene that, it was like it had been staged by Hollywood. I mean, the steam was pouring out of the car. And, I mean, it was just a mess. And he comes out and he sees it. And I said, Grandpa, I'm so sorry, but I have insurance. And I will pay for this. And he bursts out laughing. He saw how pathetic this whole thing was. You know? Yeah. And while I was there, his wife, Mary, at the time, she and I polished off a bottle of champagne and Grandpa went to bed. And she said, Sharon, you're 26 years old. You have nothing to show for your life. Well, thanks, Mary. Yeah. What do you want to do? Yeah. What do you want to do? And I was just stymied. I didn't, nothing came out of my mouth. She said, just say it. As if it were, just, just say it. 
Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It may be impossible, but just speak. And all of a sudden, out of my mouth, Jim came. I want to be an actress. She said, so? I was under I was under contract to MGM when I was your age. I said, you were? She said, yes, I wasn't any good. I only lasted a year. Um, but she said, so do it. And uh, is this story taking too long? Not at all. No, so, uh, the we next love morning, this. And well, the next morning, my grand, my, I said, please don't say anything to grandpa because he said it's a filthy business and stay out of it. So she said, I won't say anything to him. Well, the next morning, you know, I walk into the kitchen. She said, your grandfather would like to see you. I said, Damn. She told on me. So I went into my grandfather's bedroom. He's holding court in bed. And he said, that's ridiculous. I said, Grandpa, I asked Mary not to say anything to you. I knew that's how you'd feel. He said, I mean, it's ridiculous. You think I'd stop you. Mm. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, so you want to be an actress? I said, yes. He said, so what are you going to do about it? I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to acting school. He said, how much is that? Well, my cousin was an actress. And it was like $500 for three months. He said, okay, you've got $500. Jim, that was colossal to me. Colossal to me that he was going to give me $500. I have to tell him, can you hear my husband talking on the phone? It's okay. It's a little, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Barney. <laughs> She's got the pinky out. You notice the pinkies yeah. out? Sorry, he's ordering something i'm very sorry this dinner is, this is real life yeah he's already in dinner he doesn't realize that i'm Thanks. barney everybody on the show can hear you yes i'm ordering your dinner and can you. i can i have pepperoni on mine <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate he said you got five hundred dollars now what i said well uh well, thank you, Grandpa. Money had always embarrassed me. So, but anyway, thank you, Grandpa. And he said, so now, uh, so you've got $500. Then what are you going to do? I said, well, I have to go back to Los Angeles and audition for an acting class. And he said, um, so do you want to leave today? I'd just gotten there, Jim, the night before. And I said, no, Grandpa, you invited me to come and stay for two weeks with you and Mary. He said, I know what I said. So you want to go back? He he had he had racehorses. Mm. Grandpa knew when a filly was ready to run. He said, "I'm asking you again. Do you want to go back?" Yes, Grandpa. You fine. Have Mary get your ticket. And as I was flying, leaving Phoenix and flying over the Los Angeles area, I looked out and I knew I would not fail. And I don't know how I knew it, but I knew. In my heart, I said, I'm not a looker. I don't have a hot body, but I'm not going to fail in this business. So anyway, and I ended up not failing. I, I went to the acting class. And while I was in the class, one of the girls had written a play. And on the side, she asked us if we'd audition for it. So I went and auditioned. And I got the lead. We only ran two nights. We didn't charge anybody. <laughs> it wasn't a very good play. Um, but somebody was in the audience the last night, the second night, Jim, some, a man who was in publicity at Universal Studios. And he called me at my office and he said, Sharon, this is Owen Borston. I'm in publicity at Universal Studios. I just saw you in your little play. I said, yeah. I've been in the business now, Jim. I mean, I'm a number kind of, of years, right? <laughs> I said, okay, who is this? Okay, who is this? He said, I understand you're being skeptical. Why don't I have Monique James call you? Who was the head of talent? Mm -hmm. I said, do that. Shit, if she didn't call me, like five minutes later. And I went and met her in... Um, she asked me to prepare a scene for her, and I did. And when I showed it to her, she signed me that night. And I was there for 10 years. That's extraordinary. It really, really is. You know, in, in the book, you, you're very 
open and real too about alcohol and things of that nature as well. And uh, was that hard to share that or is it something that you hope people connect with so it helps them through their experiences? Well, I'd love to tell you that I was that elegant, you know, that I did it for other people. I didn't, I just, but if it helped other people, I'm so pleased. Um, uh, <laughs> when I got out of Hazleton, I was in Hazleton, which is the Harvard of the rehabs. And it got all over the news, all over the press that I was in there. And they were trying to protect me saying, no, she's not here. She's not here. So somebody, when I got out, somebody said, you were in Hazleton? I said, yeah. She said, why were you in Hazleton? And I said, apparently there were complaints, <laughs> thinking I was being witty. Well, my husband, not at the time, but he became my husband, Barney, was standing next to me and howled when I said, apparently there were complaints. And uh, that's how this story was born. That's how the book title came. It was That's why I was in Hazleton, because there were complaints about me. How did you work through that too? What was it that you were able to turn to? Um, was it his strength? Was it an inner strength to be able to get through that period of your life? I didn't think I had a choice. Did it start to interfere with the work? Not with that I knew of. No, I thought I, I didn't think I was an alcoholic at all. No. In fact, when it came time at Hazleton, we'd have our private meetings in our units you know and maybe there'd be 12 of us at the most and once a day we would meet in a circle and we'd go around saying my name is ann and i'm an alcoholic but it came time for me to say it i'd say my name is sharon and i can't say it i can't say the words i'm so sorry can't do it i want to stay i'm not trying to back out of anything but it's too foreign to me and Jim, uh, you know, I, Christine Cagney was an alcoholic. So every week for the last year, I'd been doing an AA scene. Every single week saying, my name is Christine and I'm an alcoholic. But to say my name and say I'm an alcoholic, it just, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. Mm. Because I'd been playing this character for so long. You know? Yeah. And um, anyway, Barney came to visit me after I'd been there about three weeks. It's a month's program. It's a 28-day program. I was there seven weeks. Hi. Seven weeks. And finally, Barney came to visit me, and we went on a walk. Hazleton has beautiful grounds. It's like a campus. And I said, I have to try something out on you because I can't say it. I said, anyway, my name is Sharon and I'm an alcoholic. He said, I know. I said, you know? You never said anything. He said, and I knew. He said, it didn't interfere with your work. Never, you know, it's nothing. But he said, I've known socially that you are. Anyway. It's an old story and there's so many so many people have been saved by AA. It's a fantastic organization. And he was probably waiting for the point, as opposed to him saying it, you discovering it yourself to be able to then say it. And Well, um, I wanted to go home. And I been there three weeks. And yeah. everybody else was leaving in a week. And, everybody yeah. was on the 28-day program. And I thought, well, I'd like to go home. And then I realized I can't go home until they say surrender. So you surrendered. Well, after my seven weeks, I said to my counselor, I said, so did I surrender? She said, not yet. <laughs> she said, but it's fine. Yeah. It's time for you to go home now. Right. I was very ill and, and um, there was just a lot going on and they felt it was time for me to leave. You it's mentioned a wonderful organization. Oh, just, absolutely. Now I'll tell you the first AA meeting I went to was Hazleton put you on a bus and before you go home, they send you to a real AA meeting. I mean, a real one. 
not where I'm sitting with my peers, my friends, you know. So I went to a real one and I told them, I raised my hand to speak and I said, I've been playing this alcoholic for uh, six years and the last year she goes to an AA meeting every week and I'm used to saying my name is Christine and I'm an alcoholic. I said, but I can't say my name. I said, I know I'm alcoholic, but I can't say my name. And some man came up to me after the meeting was over. He says, you're never going to make it, you know. Mm. And I thought, you know, screw you. Yes, I will. I may not be doing it in the time that everybody else does it, but and then I went and told my counselor what the man had said, and she said, Sharon, it's the program, not the people in it. I said, okay. She said, I'm sorry you had that experience. Um, I don't know why I'm even telling you the story because it's boo-hoo, and I'm not a good boo-hoo person. But it was an adjustment. It took a while for me to stop being Christine Cagney and be Sharon Gless and have a problem. It's no big deal, yeah. But as you make the adjustment, it was for me. Right, absolutely, right. And it also shows people that you're real and you're authentic and you bleed like everybody else and you have <laughs> feelings and you're not just a character on television, film and stage and you're open enough. And, and like you say, it was part of, you know, just writing the book, things of that nature, but underneath, <laughs> getting the stories out and sharing it in this fabulous book, all the different fabulous stories is sort of therapeutic and cathartic in a way, isn't it? Um, it took me seven years to write that. So it was a relief after it was over, but yes, it was cathartic. Eventually I had a lot of help, a lot, a lot of help. What did you learn about yourself as you wrote it? that uh, I could look in the mirror and see this and it was okay. That I don't have to be perfect. Um, I can't remember all the sort of wonderful things that I learned. Um, I had a problem with Christine Cagney also being sober because she was just like I am. That was her handle, man. She was witty, she was fast, she was sharp, and she was loaded at night. And um, Barney wanted me to then become, for Cagney, to then become active in the AA program and be a, and be a, uh, a, a, a you know, a, a, when you take on somebody. When you take on like somebody. Like a sponsor? Sponsor. Um, and I said, not a chance. Not Cagney. She's not going to be anybody's sponsor. You know, I mean, I, I knew who she was. I said, that's not going to happen. And he said, okay, okay, I'm just suggesting. And I said, no, it isn't easy for everybody. Right. You know, the yeah. hardest thing that Hazleton had me do was to say goodbye to my best friend. And I had to write a letter telling my best friend that I couldn't see her anymore. And of course, that's the bottle. Yep. But you had to write a letter to your best friend. Hmm. And because I thought my best friend made me feel fabulous. Right. You know? And it takes a while to get you, you know, your best friend. It's not always your best friend. Right, exactly. I'm not being some holy roller, believe me. No, but still, right. It was, it was, it was tough, you know. Yeah. It, it was, it was tough because I had Cagney in one ear, you know, for all those years and tossed it. Mary Beth and I, Time Daly and I had this thing that we started where every time Cagney would walk into the precinct, she'd just have aspirin in her hand. We thought this up for ourselves. When nothing was ever said, I just walked by her and she'd, put the aspirin, I'd take it, and not, not a word was spoken. Or occasionally I'd say, oh, I have the worst headache. <laughs> but I'd yeah. always try to make jokes about it with Cagney. Right, you know? right. And 
so that was part of the having to come to terms was that I wasn't her anymore. Saying goodbye to her was difficult. So you did character, don't you think she was? Yeah, good? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all of the characters you've taken on, you've just left your indelible mark, which is incredible. And I think this is why people are drawn to you and they can't get enough of you and they want more of you and they like to hear from you is because there's just this relatability and this comfortability. Um, even if you are nervous underneath or, or any of these things, once you are there and things are rolling, you just have this unkeen, this keen, unbelievable ability to just be, which I think is so fantastic. It doesn't seem like you're acting. It seems like that person is real. And there's elements of you in the characters, of course, that you pull from. But I think that's some of the reasons why people uh, gravitate to you. It's the authenticity. It's the, the realness of who these characters are. But underneath that, the realness of who Sharon Gless has always been and continues to be. And people find that refreshing. <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> there you go. Well, I would do anything in character and have. But um, I'm not terribly secure always in my own life. I love playing other parts. A lot of people do, right? Exactly. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. To to write exactly work work through it's it. Such a cliche. I know probably every actor is this way, but it's sort of who we are. It's much more fun being somebody else. Where does the humor come from? The wit. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, bless you. That's a lovely compliment. Oh no. Uh, I don't know. I I have an older brother, and we were very close in age, and. We just used to try and outwit each other. Yeah. You know? Yes. And uh, he's um, ill at the moment, so mm -hmm. I'm going home at Christmas to see him. That's beautiful. And, um, but we were raised together. I have another brother who's much younger, but my older brother and I were very close in age, and it was just cool to be cool with each other, you know? Got to be cool. And that's sort of how we always were, and we tried to top each other doesn't sound very sophisticated, but that's sort of no. Weird. But that's a, that's the that's sibling relationships. Yeah, that's, that's where it first came from was was trying to top my brother. Real life for sure. <laughs> yeah. What have you not done in this extraordinary ongoing career that is something out there that still tickles your fancy, Sharon? I'd like to do one more series. Series television is my favorite thing to do. I don't yeah. know how much yeah. it's changed now, but. It's where I excelled. It's I've done uh, someone who did some research on me said, do you know you've done nine television series? I said, no. She said, that's Betty White did one more than you. Right. And yeah. I said, oh, my God. Then I, I want to meet, not meet Betty at the moment. Someday I will. Um, but I got to match Betty. Yeah. I'd love to do, do my 10th and have it be a hit, you know. Would it be a comedic? Would it be sitcom, a drama? Or I prefer doing a drama and having comedy within it. Yeah. I, sitcoms are not, the live audience and sitcoms just, I like one camera comedies. One camera yeah. sitcoms. Right. But I don't like it in front of the live audience. It's not a bump, but dump bump, you know, and it's, right. there's, yeah. it's not the way I work. So, Anyway, I, I admire so much the, the actors and actresses who do the, the half hour comedy in front of a live audience is just something I'm not comfortable with. I like the camera. Yes. I like to know where it is. <laughs> you right, know? right, exactly. And, and those, yeah. On those half hour sitcoms in front of a live audience, you don't know where it is. You it's don't all know. over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your partner is halfway across the stage. And I like the intimacy of a one camera show. Right, exactly. 
Did your, S partner, your partner is standing right next to the camera. If you see your close up, they're right next to you. They're right there. The camera doesn't frighten me. I enjoy it. Did you enjoy co executive producing Show Her the Money to have that opportunity to well, be I, involved in it? I did. At first, I thought I was in way over my head because these women are extraordinary. Um, but I learned so much, and it's the next step for me after Cagney and Lacey uh, to be involved with these women who are raising money. As I said, women, 2% of women get funding, right? <laughs> it's my best friend, Don LaFrieda. She's one of these stories featured, and her story is so amazing that uh, – one critic said that she should have a feature just done on her life. Just done her life. Just done on her life. Um, uh, but it it's so nice to be invited into this arena. <laughs> such a ham. Such a ham. Uh, it's much it's all more in the eyes. <laughs> much more serious than this honest. We're just goofing around. Yeah. Um, but women being left out of funding is is it's a crime. Yeah. And only men get it. So you'll see in this story the women who are funding other women and being very successful at it. Very successful. So when they. I went to the first, uh, Dawn asked me to come and just watch as some women were pitching to other women who were going to be funding. Right. And there was one story that just broke my heart. Yeah. And I. I finally sort of understood what was going on in that room. And I said, I'd like to be involved. Yeah. Yep. So that's anyway, it's a very good movie. As I said, we've won every city we've been in. We won best documentary so far. Yeah. And all these great awards. Is this something now out available now? People can see it. It's a screening in order to, to, uh, qualify for like the Oscars or you have to screen, I believe for a week or two in Los Angeles and for a week or two in New York. And right. we finished our run in Los Angeles and won best documentary. Yes. I know. And now we're doing now, right now it's running in New York. Check it out, gang. Absolutely. Check it out. Show her the money. Show her the money. That is congratulations long on that. Long overdue, long overdue, and, and it's yeah. so great. It's just so correct. And the fact that we're in this position is shocking. It's, it's amazing, and it's uh, relevant and very important, uh, yeah. an important message, you know? The movie's, the movie's also fun. I mean, it's 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 inspiring, yeah. it's fun, and and uh, it's sad. So I'm right. going to touch you, break your heart. Because it's, it's reality, right, exactly. Mm. You even were in the Scarlet O'Hara War. I was. <laughs> she does it all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Jump up. Um, Moviola. And yeah. Carol Lombard. Yes. Who I, I've been a great fan of Ms. Lombard's, Miss Lombard's, for um, many, many years. And I went and read for it four times. And I finally got it. Because I know physically I don't look like Carol. Carol was very tiny, um, but I knew I had her wit. Yeah. And um, I was under contract to Universal, but they didn't. Their contract players they never put in their features, only television. And they did Gable and Lombard at Universal. That didn't let me read for for Lombard at all. Jill Clayburn played her. Did a lovely job. But I should have done it. <laughs> That's amazing, true, when you think about it. Uh, you were that was really cool playing her. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was so, so wonderful. And it was, it was the story of all the actresses who wanted to play Scarlett O'Hara. And every actress in Hollywood wanted that part, except yeah. Carol Lombard. Except Carol Lombard. She didn't want it. And Gable wanted her to take it because he was married to her. He was in love with her. Right. Um, but she knew. Carol Lombard is, is, is um, um, not Vivian Lee. Carol Lombard is, is Scarlett O'Hara. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. 
<laughs> she knew. She knew. Yeah. You, you know, when you look at this extraordinary and ongoing epic career, what are some of those blessings and joys in your life that have kept you through all of these experiences, you know, the ups, the downs, the good moments, the crazy moments, the, the inspirations and blessings in your life that have kept you going and producing and creating and performing and being involved in the world of art and entertainment for really the good of all of us when you look at it. Well, I would say we don't do this alone. We do not do this alone. And most of my career, uh, Monique James was my manager. She was, she was the head of talent at Universal. And she left Universal to manage me. And I was always somebody who was insecure in person, not in the role, but she's the one who would push me, push me, push me, push me. And, and without her, I would have had nothing. And then uh, Barney Rosenzweig, my producer on Cagney and Lacey, also with Monique's encouragement, and he pushed me, pushed me, feeling that I was the one he wanted for Cagney. And that changed my career again. And um, now, as I said, this next phase of my career that I'm involved in Show Her the Money, my best friend, uh, Don Vrida, was responsible. If I look at all the moves in my life, there's always somebody behind me. Always somebody pushing me, encouraging me. Um, you wouldn't know it because I'm talking so much tonight, but I- No, even, it sounds like even those who sort of said, well, I'm not sure, or you know, even the toughness of the grandmother early on, you, you were able to take some of the wording that you received and find it as a challenge as if i'm going to show them i'm going to prove them that i can actually do this i can go forward i can make it happen i so, knew i would i knew i could right, which is an amazing thing early on right yes but it took me to age 26 to say, say it or to believe it or both to believe it I, say, I, I used to say at six years old, I used to say I want to be an actor. I'm going to be a star. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but to actually say it and believe it, it took that guts to get up and do that scene for Minnie James at Universal. Yeah. So there was nobody pushing me then. I had to do it. I had to step up. But she signed me that night. I thought, whoa, there's somebody who believes in me. Yeah. This is right for me. Mm -hmm. But I told my grandfather, you know, who's a big lawyer, and I, they were paying me $186 a week, and I was making $250 as a secretary. And I asked my grandfather, I said, would you talk to, do you know Lou Wasserman, Grandpa? He said, I know Lou very well. I said, would you talk to him about my salary? How can you? <laughs> Winnie James would have, she would have been so angry if I had ever gone What over. are you doing? <laughs> And my grandfather said, um, Sharon, do you want to be an actress? I said, yes, Grandpa. He said, then sign the contract. I said, but Grandpa, he said, Sharon, you are not coming from a position of strength from which to negotiate. Sign it and let's see how you do. Let's see next year how you're doing and then maybe I'll talk to Lou. And Grandpa never lived to see me on film. Um, but he is in spirit around oh, you. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. They're all around, right? I do believe that. Yes. I do yeah. believe I'm never alone. No, not at all. Not at all. What was it like when you finished the book? When did you know you were done? You could put the last period on the sentence and you well, that, the hardest, The hardest chapter to write was the last one. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was so, so hard because I knew it was the end. Right. Not the end of my life, but the end no. of this, yeah. my life on paper. Yeah. And, um, and I chose a very different way to go with it at the end. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm happy the way I did it. And um, and then the last thing was then was picking the photos. Yeah. Getting permission from certain studios to use them. And certain studios wouldn't return my call or it let me use them. I used them anyway. 
I mean, come on. Yeah. It yeah. promotes the product anyway, right? Well, yeah. but they were pictures that were important to me. It's a part of the whole I'm story. Given. Yeah. I own them, but they were from a certain project by another studio, and all of a sudden people are getting, you know, territorial with me. Right. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Brush off. Brush <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm going to use that in the Hell, future. Please. Yeah. Absolutely. If somebody cuts me off on the highway next time, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to save the words. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, the, and the fingers. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. No. These no. days. Oh, these. Woo. Ah. How did you get through the last couple of years? It's been life changing. It's been really interesting. We've reevaluated. We've taken a look at our lives. We've some people have uh, come out of it warmer, closer, understanding the importance of us being you mean together. COVID? Yeah, and and uh, and then others have sort of gone off into their own directions. Overall, how? How have you been able to get through all of that? I don't have any rules or any. Um, uh, I live on an island. This is a high class problem. I live on a very beautiful island. And for almost three years, I rarely left it. Um, I did get COVID once, but it was a, really a mild case. And I'm just blessed because some lives were changed tragically forever. And I didn't know what was going to happen to any of us as we all hit out, you know. Um, I, I really, I didn't know how it would end. But I knew I'd still be around. Hopefully, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live a long time. Um, yes, you are. In my heart, I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to lose family members, and I never had to suffer that loss. So I've been, I've been blessed, but I feel in a selfish way I don't even know how to discuss it right. because I have not gone through the tragedies that a lot of people have. Exactly. I just sat and got to know my husband again. Yeah, right. You know, watched, yeah. um, oh, what's that? Uh, that wonderful series that takes place in the West Wing. Oh, I yeah. Sure. West Wing, what is it, seven years or something? Yeah. I watched every episode. Rob so Lowe, watched, Martin uh, Sheen. Yeah. Oh, yes, fantastic, fantastic writing, fantastic actors. Yes. And uh, I just learned, I studied other actors. I, Do you ever watch any of your material? Never. There's a lot of people who say that. I think I heard Johnny Depp once say that he never watches a movie he's in. I can't ever, ever, ever. And is that you see things character. wrong or you all detach see, from it? All I see are my mistakes, how awful I look, what a terrible performance that was, yada, yada, yada. From what people tell me, none of this is true, but no. that's what I see. What you see, right? That's yeah. what I see. And you demand uh, a lot from yourself, yeah. Yeah, and, and Monique used to say, you know, Tyne has been watching the show. You have a responsibility to Cagney and Lacey to watch. I said, I can't. Yeah. So finally, she said, Sharon, it's time to grow up. So I'd take a bucket of ice in the den, a bottle of scotch, and I'd pour a couple of stiff ones, and I'd watch it and say, shit, looks good to me. <laughs> but... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but right. watching it without that, you know, relief, the clarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I still, I did a series called "The Trials of Rosie O'Neill," and my husband yes. was playing it right. during COVID once, and I heard my voice, and so I backed up into the living room to sort of look. You know, I thought, "Gee, I was really thin." <laughs> That's, I mean, I'm so used to seeing you know, myself is fat or I don't like what I'm doing or, and I sat down and I watched the entire series and I thought, well, that was, that was good. It's good in that. Yes. Right. Yeah. But I first had to get past the fact that I wasn't fat. 
you know, no, it sounds shallow. No, it doesn't. I understand what you're saying because I've had this conversation with folks. I, I can relate to what you're saying, which is, I think, part of why I ask that because um, when I first see or hear work that I do on television or radio or what have you, I will hear what the others are saying producers, other, that was terrific. You nailed it. Wow. That was fantastic. That was genuine. You made everybody feel good. You brought the best out all of those things that they say, but I won't necessarily be convinced. And when I first see it on, whether it's television or hear it on the air or whatever, at first there's that shock value. So I don't like it right away. And like you, my eye is zooming in on what did I wear that shirt for? Maybe if I had looked this way, <laughs> what was happening around me? You're thinking small. of all these things, right? Yeah. And it's there's a there's a certain built up internal expectation that you place on it, and it's the emotion and striving for excellence and all of that. So when it comes on, it's there's a shock value because now you, first you were seeing it this way from your eyes out. Now you're seeing it the other way as everybody else is seeing it. And I, now I can pull out tapes of things from 20 years ago and watch it and sit there and go, you know what? Under those conditions, with everything that was going on, with that experience, with and being emotionally detached from it now, that actually wasn't too bad. That was pretty good. Oh, I like the way I made them laugh or the, yeah, I, I I need to be emotionally detached from it to appreciate what everybody else is saying and exactly. sharing. And I can connect with that, with what you're saying. I was uh, is saying, that an Irish thing? <laughs> no, I always was saying, gee, I thought I was better than that. You know? Right. Gee, I thought I was better than that. But fortunately, most people aren't agreeing with me. So, uh, it's just something I know about myself that I can't be objective. And do you think it drives you? It's a, it's a motivator to what? To continue to plow through, to continue to strive, to do the best, to have that little angst like that. Well, not, no, I don't think it's because of the angst that I want to do it. I just love doing it because it's fun. I love to act. And you're very good at it. Uh, <laughs> you're very good at it. Matter of fact, I just want to show you uh, before we wrap uh, some wonderful comments that have coming in live from our viewers around the world. Our Gym Master Show Lovities. Uh, welcome, Sharon, to Lovity Hall. You just became a Lovity. How cool is that? Wow, thank Emmys, you. Emmys, Golden Globes, all these awards. But when you get a Lovity on the Gym Master Show Live, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Oh, Most well, I'm thrilled. Most Thank people, you. most people say their feet start tingling. One of our guests said, <laughs> one guest started levitating. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll check on this for you, Gary Collins here. The second good evening, Jim. I have a question for Sharon Glass. Sharon on switch. Did Eddie Albert enjoy wearing those inexpensive suits? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't realize they were inexpensive <laughs> at the time. You know, the studio was paying for them. So I thought, yeah. Kathleen welcomes you. She know. welcomes you from New York City. And Chris welcomes you from Northern Ireland. Oh, um, Kathleen in New York City. La Ireland's beautiful. She loved Cagney and Lacey as well. And uh, Carol. Uh, hello there, Jim. Hello, uh, Miss Glass. I loved the show so much. And uh, thank you very much for that comment as well. And uh Michael says, uh, Ms. Glass, you have the most beautiful smile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we were just talking about this uh, off air, Merlin, watching in Canada. Um, being, well, she's from California, but she's in Florida. How do you keep that beautiful, fair complexion? <laughs> be the lighting in here. I lit my own thing here, you know. So. That's um, it. I never go in the sun. Yeah. But when I was a kid in L.A., I was, you know, a kid lying on the beach in the 50s. We all got fried. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. We yeah. didn't know. Who knew? Yeah. That's that's We put iodine in our baby oil. Right. <laughs> it's it gets darker. 
Yeah. She remembered, uh, Carol remembered uh, when Cagney Lacey was on television, loved the show every week, watched it every time. She was sad when it came to an end. Of Thank course, you. yeah, when shows come to an end, people get... Well, that show was brought back by the by the public. It was the first and I believe last time that... that, that it, was a it, was, it was a massive thing, right? They wrote to all the affiliated stations and then the CBS affiliates sent all of the mail to the headquarters and said, look... Exactly. That campaign was started by Barney Rosensway. It was. It answered everybody's letter everybody's letter saying forgive the form letter but you're the one with the power so write in and everybody did they each wrote two letters and mm. and, and it, did you ever could you ever imagine and that brought it back huh that brought it back right and then they brought they brought us back and we they had to redo our contracts we became the highest paid women in television Which at that time at that time, we, we never occurred to us to ask what the men were making, but it's all right. These are great. These are great stories. Thank you, uh, Austin, Alessandra, Sharon Gless. I love doing Cagney and Lacey. Thank you. And, uh, oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for all these great comments, everybody. Um, this is really nice to see. Sherry's watching in Kansas. She sends you love. And uh, I think one of the stories you had mentioned as far as where you should have won uh, Anastasia, yeah. love all your work, Sharon, and you should have won. And she's sending a pink wave. And I believe her mother had was a guest on our show, and her mother was a wonderful person, and boy, was she funny. And uh, Sky Aubrey, a legendary actress. Oh, I and remember she Sky. Said, Sky was under contract to Universal. She said, I believe somewhere, Anastasia said i i think jim my mom, aubrey was her dad he was a really big powerful I, guy i think my mom sky aubrey did lady of the deep in 1977 wow um, i remember sky i think she meaning sharon was in a show with sky I my was. mom can you ask her jim she, i don't know which one it was she may have come and done a switch with us with robert Wagner. so this is anastasia sky aubrey's daughter Oh yeah. my gosh, hi. Yeah, sending her love to you as well hi. here. I love to your mom. Yeah, which is fantastic. Austin Field said, I loved you in the series, Queer as Folk. That was a groundbreaking show. So glad to be seeing this interview with you and Jim. Thank, Thank you very much, Austin Field and Jen Berry in Pennsylvania. Fun show tonight. Absolutely. And we love all of these. Uh, David says, well, You're a Sharon wonderful host. I so. appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Sharon's narration on her audiobook was fantastic. Her, inf her inflections, your, the inflections added a lot. A great listen and a great read. Thank you. I'd love to do that again. I, I, when I was young, I used to read other people's books, and I nice. love doing uh, radio and, and yeah. reading other people's and work, narrating and. Sure. Um, uh, Anastasia, Sky Aubrey's daughter, says, so excited to read the memoir. And she loved the dress you had designed on the second Emmy. <laughs> that was the blue one that was ended up being $7,000. I said, well, I don't <laughs> see it again. And Sorry. that's my one again. So it was nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. New York City, Kathleen, we love hearing your stories. Absolutely. She's a wonderful storyteller and uh, a very gracious guest to spend this time with us. Uh, David says, Cagney and, Cagney and Debbie, both of your characters, are the realest of the real characters from David. That's really fantastic. So true and fabulous. Uh, another wonderful show. Subscribe, of course, for excellent content. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You guys are wonderful with all these comments coming in from uh, around the world. Anastasia Sky Arbery's daughter adds, I'm so excited to start the book after the phenomenal, true interview that you and I just had. And that's my style. It's conversational. This isn't like an interview. It's conversation. And we have a wonderful time back and forth, sort of like Dick Cavett, Carson, old school with a modern style. Sherry Larson in Kansas says, thank you for being here tonight, Sharon. What a career in life. Thank you for opening up and telling us about uh, all you've been through and experienced in your life. Jane in Sweden. Great life. Thanks, Sharon, for being with us tonight. 
Uh, thank you. Um, she loves your wit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, and Sky Arbery's daughter, Anastasia, says, so happy and feel grateful to have learned more about a tremendous woman and actress. That's fantastic. I'm glad that you did. Um, I enjoyed myself, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. And as my father, you know, you get wisdom from the uh, parents and others sometimes uh, throughout the years. My father, you'll appreciate this, my Irish dad from New York City, from Astoria, seven years old, he tells me, Jim, now, and my father so good with these incredible, you know, comments about life and observations with his wit and wisdom. Seven years old, tells me, whenever anybody says something kind or nice, Jim, always thank them. And then ask them to please put that in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's so you, true. You've been wonderful. My husband is standing over there going. <laughs> the, the dinner's getting cold. <laughs> You're amazing, Sharon. I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely I have with you. I very much enjoyed it, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. You are very, very welcome. We'll keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime. And blessings of the holidays to you and your family and the thank new you year. So and much to you too. Thank let's you. let's stay in touch and thank you for all the time you graced us with your beautiful presence this evening, Sharon. Bless you. You be thank well. You. Bye, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. You as well. Take care, Sharon. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much to Sharon Glass. What an extraordinary conversation, you know, and that's what we have here on the show. And the guests can stay with us for, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, however long they want. We just let it roll. And uh, she had a lot to share and she did it in such an eloquent way and uh, in a real way. And you guys have been commenting in our chat room constantly throughout the uh, start of the broadcast. We thank you so much for doing that watching from all around the world. If you missed any of this conversation here on the Jim Masters Show live series, uh, well then guess what? You can see it again archived right here on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. So never fret if you come in late or perhaps you, know, you wanna see something again, uh, there's well over a thousand, almost a thousand forty episodes we've done in three and a half years of our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series with uh, the art of conversation being brought back to life, as we've said. I just want to show you a couple of things. The book, which a lot of you have all, there I am sliding into the screen. A lot of you have said you were already ordering uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble, all those great places. It's, it's an, an incredible read and it's an acclaimed book and winning all kinds of awards. Apparently, there were complaints. She's open. She's real. She's honest. She's funny. The stories, we didn't want to give too much away, but it's an extraordinary read. And we congratulate her on a memoir that took seven years. This is seven years in the making. And she shared some wonderful stories tonight too, didn't she? Uh, behind the scenes, real, authentic about the time on some of the iconic television series and shows, working with so many different people, of course, noted for Cagney and Lacey, of course, and queer as folk, and but so much more uh, beyond that, uh, those iconic series. And uh, again, to spend some time with us, and that now she's got the dinner there. Uh, they're reheating it. <laughs> and uh, she, she's in the little green room there waving. And uh, we thank her for spending time with us. She's a blessing. And she's welcome back here at Lovety Hall and the Jim Master Show anytime. And thank you, everybody, for all of your commentary. Uh, just a, a little reminder, uh, there's a couple of other folks uh, we're working on getting Anne Margaret here on the show. Uh, Linda Gray from Dallas was just with us recently. Adrian Zmed was just here. Marion Ross was here recently and so many more. Uh, great guests, special guests from all around the world and from all different levels of success and celebrity. Some of them are personal friends of mine and others I've interviewed on television over the years and radio, and they stopped by JMS. 
Uh, we're glad that you stopped by JMS as well. And we thank you so very much for doing that. Also want to remind you to look out for this. It's showing now in New York and then it goes from there. We'll keep you posted on it. Uh, show her the money, this incredible documentary that, uh, Sharon is in and also co-produced and it's a really, really special piece of work. So look for that, uh, everywhere. And some amazing stories about some of the other iconic shows that she's been in and some of the other stars that she's had an opportunity to work with. And of course, she opens up about her life too in the book and did on our conversation. We thank her so much, the incomparable Emmy and Golden Globe winning, multi-winning actress, author, producer, and so much more. The one and only Sharon Gless stopping by the Jim Masters Show live series. We really hope you enjoyed this, everybody. If you did here on the YouTube channel, we would love it if you give this episode a thumbs up like. There's a like icon, you know, a thumbs up. You see the little icon on the YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Click like, leave a comment on the channel. Yeah, comment, interact with us. What's one of your favorite shows that Sharon Gless has been in? One of your favorite episodes of some of the series? Uh, what would you like to see her in in the future? Uh, have you read her book? Let us know if you read the book. Leave a comment underneath this episode on the YouTube channel as well and share it and spread the word, spread the levity. Tell everybody you know about the Jim Master Show Live series. And uh, we are having a good time here bringing back the Lost Art of Conversation. Deep conversations, lots of fun, interaction with all of you around the world. And for that, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, we wish you and yours the best of the holidays as well. And uh, a very Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Happy New Year. We are in the midst of the holiday season and uh, we have more shows coming up for you. But uh, this is always a, a blessing and a blast to put these episodes together. And it was really wonderful having Sharon here and uh, again, her being so open and real and fun and uh, responsive and engaging. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thanks again for all these great comments from everybody around the world. Uh, thank you so very, very much. And Anastasia tells Sharon to enjoy her dinner. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, that that's, that's always, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yes, actually, um, Anastasia, I did mention that your legendary and phenomenal mom, Sky, has passed. And um, really amazing. These comments uh, are really a blessing as well. Thank you, everybody, for all of these comments and, and for watching and sharing and supporting the Gym Master Show Life series. Gang, if this is your first time here, we welcome you. Come see us again and binge watch uh, again hundreds and hundreds of episodes available for the asking, the watching, the enjoying on our YouTube channel. One more time, thank you to Sharon Glass right here exclusively live on the Gym Master Show Live series. And thanks to all of you for being with us. We appreciate it. And everybody in the chat room, thank you for all the comments as well. We will see you on the next episode. As I always say, I'll be right here waiting for you to entertain, inform, educate, Put a smile on your face and have a good time with you here at JMS, the Gym Master Show Live. We don't say goodbye around here. We say see you later and ciao and cheers and all the other ways you can say see you later. And uh, come see us again. It's your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. Right here in Lovety Hall at the Gym Master Show Live series. Take care and be well. Love one another. Take care of one another. And don't forget to take time for yourself and love yourself as well. Happy holidays, gang. We'll see you on the next episode of The Gym Master Show Live. And cheers. <laughs>